to carry on the legacy. Um, but Phi is the, um, it's known by many to be one of the oldest, if not the oldest, uh, free market um, organization promoting the ideals of a free society. And it's evolved over the years, but it's, it's kept that mission. And today, its mission is narrowed to focus on inspiring, educating, and connecting uh, young future leaders to the ethical and economic principles of a free society. And um, tonight, our, our president, Larry Reed, is going to tie the movie that you saw uh, back to some critical times in history, uh, at which points um, governments got too much power and took away the liberties of people. Uh, and liberties that today we just take for granted. So Larry's going to bring that home to us tonight. Um, I encourage you to take a look at our website, fee.org. Many of you get our magazine or have seen it online, The Freeman. And uh, Todd's going to have this on the back table tomorrow, too. So I encourage you guys to check it out, as well as Larry's uh, recent book, A Republic If We Can Keep It. So uh, our speaker tonight is uh, just a great delight to listen to. Uh, personal look up to him and an inspiring speaker. Uh, Larry's traveled the world um, time and time again, especially across Eastern Europe. Um, in times in history where freedoms were uh, abandoned. And Larry's seen that firsthand and been underground movement of uh, times of the fight of communism. And he can speak to that experience uh, personally tonight. So, Larry? Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan and Todd. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to be here. Can you hear me in the back uh, if I speak at this level? OK, great. Well, I want to do more than just thank you. I want to commend you. I can't remember the last time I spoke to an audience uh, at quarter to nine at night after they've had a break, after they had a two hour plus movie to see. So I can't believe it. You, uh, I, uh, you knew I was coming, and you stayed anyway. I'm just <laughs> thrilled and, and honored. <laughs> I am not a uh, movie critic, although I've written a couple movie reviews over the years, and my purpose tonight is not to critically and in any detailed fashion analyze the movie you just saw, but rather apply some of its themes to a particular and very important chapter in human history. Uh, the, uh, some of the themes that run through the Hunger Games uh, have been, uh, this was a repeat really of some other films in the past that have had similar themes of a post-apocalyptic dystopian society where liberties have been lost and where a big brother regime of some sort is in charge. Uh, 1984 by Orwell, uh, the book anyway, A Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. Uh, there have been other works like this and most of them uh, start with the poke post-apocalyptic era. They don't tell you much about or even hypothesize how it came to be that a society that presumably was once much freer is now not free anymore. That just sort of start with the lack of freedom. And I thought it might be useful for us to talk about a real-life society in human history that achieved a surprising degree of freedom and then lost it all. Uh, and the regime to follow or, uh, doesn't look quite like uh, the all-powerful one in the Hunger Games, but there are plenty of common threads. And the society I'm talking about is that of ancient Rome. And uh, uh, I want to start by giving you some measures of how radically things changed from when Rome was at its height to not all that many <coughs> centuries later when Rome was at its nadir as a city. Uh, here are just a couple uh, such figures. Do you know in 70 AD, when the Emperor Vespasian began building the Colosseum, that era, and that period is roughly regarded by most historians as the pinnacle of Roman influence, or close to that time anyway, there were a million people in the city of Rome. A million people in the city. Anybody know how low the population of the city of Rome got in subsequent centuries when it reached its low point? Yes? About 10,000. Uh, I, th I think it was a little higher than that, but the <coughs> vicinity, I was going to say 17,000, uh, according to my recollection. But you can see whether it's 10 or 17, that's a far cry uh, from a million people. 
Um, and even uh, at the time that when Napoleon invaded, almost 18 centuries later, um, Rome was uh, still all, not all that large. It was 10 times, in 70 AD, it was 10 times the size that it was when Napoleon invaded, barely 200 years ago, 18 centuries after um, uh, Vespasian began building the, uh, the Colosseum. Rome is a society that was born in uh, a, a fashion similar to that of America. It was born in a violent overthrow of tyrants. In uh, around 500 BC, uh, Romans overthrew the rule of the Etruscans uh, that had run uh, most of Italy for uh, quite a long time. And the Romans were so uh, tired and so leery, so wary of tyrannical regimes and all-powerful monarchies that the first thing they did was to establish a republic. After they threw off a just and rule, the Romans set up a system, a political system, whereby uh, the uh, uh, power was split among two consuls and even had term limits. They could only serve a year and then they had to move along. So Romans really wanted to be very careful that the leaders they did have didn't uh, stick around long enough to accumulate anywhere near the kind of power that they had just overthrown. They established uh, a senate, admittedly, uh, uh, run pretty much by the more noble families. It was an exclusive club, but nonetheless it was a kind of representative body, which in the world at that time was uh, virtually, if not totally, unknown. Uh, and in time it was set up uh, popular assemblies where people uh, were elected. I don't want to suggest to you that Rome ever, even at the height of its republic, achieved anything like a libertarian society. Rome always had slavery. Uh, but for many Romans, there was, for a time, a considerable period, several centuries, a degree of individual liberty and representative government that the world had not known before and would not know again after Rome uh, fell for hundreds and hundreds of years. So it was a very important, interesting moment in history. And you might say that for a brief time, many Romans achieved a degree of freedom that only a tiny single digit fraction of those who've ever lived on this planet have been blessed to have, including uh, uh, Americans. Well, uh, by the second century BC, after uh, several hundred years of the Republic, it's apparent by this time that uh, Rome is a society uh, with significant industry, far-reaching influence uh, throughout the Mediterranean region, and the rise of uh, major enterprises, big businesses, are quite apparent by the second century. This is a thriving civilization by this time, with a considerable degree of, uh, of freedom. Uh, Rome, by the second century, had a stock market, it had uh, large town markets, it had uh, 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 a degree of uh, commerce with much of the Mediterranean world that had been unknown before its time. Uh, how many of you have seen the movie uh, The Life of Brian, Monty Python film? You remember that hilarious moment where uh, it's really a tribute to uh, what the Romans did for much of the wor world at that time. But uh, it takes place, uh, this scene takes place in uh, Roman-occupied Palestine. And John Cleese is trying to whip up uh, a resistance to the Romans. And he's got an assembly of Romans in front of him. He's trying to stir them up. And at one point he says, uh, after all, what have the Romans ever done for us? Rose. And then somebody in the yeah. back, somebody in the back, doesn't say Rose just yet, but somebody in the back says, aqueducts. And he says, well, okay, aqueducts. Other than aqueducts, what have the Romans ever done for us? Then you hear voices like roads, education, uh, commerce, public safety, recreation, sanitation, you know. And then he runs down that long list and says, okay, other than aqueducts, sanitation, public safety, what have the Romans ever done for us? Well, that's a, a kind of a backhanded tribute to uh, the great achievements uh, of Rome even though there were plenty of people within Roman jurisdictions who were either forcibly conquered or enslaved. And this is not a libertarian society, but a greater degree of freedom and representative government in society than uh, we had seen anywhere perhaps up to that time and wouldn't see again for a long time thereafter. The question is, why was all that lost? How did Rome go from a relatively free society, 
at least for most or many Romans, uh, to a totalitarian dictatorship. How did it happen? Some people say, well, it was because of foreign invasion, that Romans were free until the barbarians <coughs> took them over and imposed some kind of a totalitarian system. But I want to suggest to you tonight that that was not the case at all, that Rome, by the time the city falls in 476 AD, really had pretty much committed suicide. It had fastened upon itself a totalitarian welfare state, uh, and so, uh, so weakened itself from within that it fell like a right thumb by 476. So I just want to uh, highlight some of the steps along that way. How did they get uh, to an apocalyptic situation where a once free society had degenerated into a totalitarian one? Here are some of the uh, uh, hallmarks along the way. But first, I want, I want to suggest to you what the governing theme of this decline is. I know a lot of attempts have been made to explain the fall of the uh, Roman Republic and later the Empire. I've even heard, uh, I don't know who it was, but somebody postulated that it was the lead in Roman pottery that caused the decline because uh, they ingested this lead, they kind of made them go nuts, and then they did crazy things, and then they lost their independence and their liberty. I, I don't think that there's much credence in that. I think that the primary reason, overwhelming reason, for Rome's slide from relative freedom to a totalitarian dictatorship and an empire, an unaffordable empire, was a change, a fundamental change in how Romans viewed the proper source of personal income. Now, that may sound very base and commercial or economic, but I really think it's at the root here. I think I, what I'm describing is that the fall of Rome is coincident with and caused by the rise of the Roman welfare state. It really started rather modestly. Uh, around and within the second by the second century BC, several hundred years after throwing off Etruscan rule, there are rumblings uh, from certain circles in, in that talk about things like uh, the gap between the rich and the poor, and the use of government to, to uh, equalize incomes or at least reduce that gap. And politicians begin to arise that call for the redistribution of income by force. The first group of people within ancient Roman society to really uh, become significant recipients of this uh, uh, Roman welfare state were the veterans. Uh, early Roman leaders decided that, hey, uh, let's buy the support of our men uh, in, uh, because uh, that will assure their allegiance, and we can do that by throwing public money at them. But the problem is, really, Welfare state is that once you go from government doing a little more than, uh, let's say, providing for the common defense, once it's viewed as a, as, as a fountain of goodies, let's say, the problem is that you can't just name one group and say, we'll give you special benefits without having lots of other groups eventually line up and say, hey, I'm special too. I'm pretty important. I do an important job here. Why shouldn't I get something? And so it goes far beyond what maybe the early uh, advocates of this uh, way of thinking first intended, I don't know, but certainly before it's all done, almost every aspect of Roman society will be subsidized and controlled uh, by the state. Uh, there was an economist by the name of Howard Kirshner, passed away about 25 years ago, that, uh, who penned something that's become known as Kirshner's First Law, and I think it sums up the course of a lot of societies, Rome in particular, and it reads as follows. When a self-governing people confer upon their government the power to take from some to give to others, the process will not stop until the last bone of the last taxpayer is picked bare. Think of that. When a self-governing people confer upon their government the power to take from some and give to others, the process will not stop until the last bone of the last taxpayer is picked bare. The only thing I would quarrel uh, with on that uh, person's first law would be that it seems to suggest that once a, a society starts down this path of voting for a living instead of just working for one, that there is no turning back. I don't believe that. If I did, I'd 
I guess we wouldn't be doing what we're doing at the Foundation for Economic Education. We'd just give up, pack our bags, and find something else to do and go along for the ride and enjoy the decline as best we could. But uh, we think you can turn around. And I'd like to think that by learning some of the lessons that past societies like Rome have gone through might help us turn the tide. But we also know that in Rome's case, the tide did not turn, even though there were moments uh, when uh, they had opportunities to reverse the slide, uh, but didn't take them or didn't take them for very long. Uh, Clodius is an important figure, C-L-O-D-I-U-S. Clodius in the first century AD gets elected to the position of tribune on the platform of free wheat for the masses. And that's the primary way, at least for quite, quite a long time, that the Roman welfare state bestowed its benefits upon large numbers of people in the form of free grain. And you'll see in a moment, that when we get a little further ahead in history, how that trans uh, uh, was uh, transformed into something even uh, far more generous than just that. In 49 BC, when Julius Caesar uh, came to power, he actually cut the relief rolls within the city of Rome from 320,000 to 200,000. And you might say, well, there was an opportunity. There was a guy who came in and said, uh, hey, you know, this is not affordable or sustainable. I'm going to slash the welfare rolls dramatically. But within half a century, they were back up to beyond where they were when Caesar cut them. Which suggests, I think, that you know, if you could have somebody on the stage for the moment who might uh, forestall a decline and do the right thing, but if the people uh, aren't with it, or if the ideas of the people continue to support the policies that are contributing to the decline, it's only a matter of time before somebody else comes to power, panders to those people, and gives them what they want. And that's exactly what happened in ancient Rome. Uh, let me jump ahead uh, chronologically here a little bit, since I've just mentioned the uh, welfare in the form of wheat. In 274 AD, this is long after the end of the Republic, which comes to an end in the first century BC. In 274 AD, the Emperor Aurelian, uh, presiding over a government that had been passing out subsidized grain for two centuries at that point, he decides to go one step further. He makes the right to relief hereditary. In other words, if your parents have been receiving uh, public benefits, then you as a matter of right, not a privilege, not perhaps a short-term handout, but rather as a matter of, in, of right, were entitled to public benefits. And he added not just uh, free wheat, but free pork, free salt, free olive oil, free other uh, staples of the Roman diet. And so you have the Roman government in a very major way providing much of uh, the daily sustenance for huge numbers of Romans, a huge and growing number. Uh, Aurelian also did something else. It was under his reign that uh, welfare payments, instead of being given in the form of, uh, of free wheat, supplemented by these other things he added, he actually got the government in the business of grinding the wheat and baking it into bread and giving the bread uh, to the recipients. In other words, they weren't even required to make grain useful to them. They got the finished product. And now as a matter of right, uh, at uh, public expense. There's an old story I'd like to tell, and I'm going to pause at this point to, to tie it in to, and tell the story. It doesn't originate with me. It goes back to an old friend from Tennessee uh, named Tom Anderson, who told us a story about a band of wild hogs. Anybody know what story I'm referring to? It's about a band of wild hogs that lived along a bend of a river in Georgia somewhere. The lesson of this little story you can apply, I think, to the course of ancient Rome. But this band of wild hogs was a stubborn and ornery and independent bunch. They had survived floods and freezes and fires and droughts and hunters and dogs, you name it. Nobody thought that these wild hogs could ever be captured. But one day, a stranger came into town, and he went into the general store, and he said to the storekeeper, I've got a plan to pen up the wild hogs. Can you tell me where I can find them? And the storekeeper laughed at him and said, well, you never do, uh, do, you'll never do that. But he gave him some general directions, and off the stranger went. 
with nothing but a few sacks of corn and an axe and a one-horse wagon. And he came back into town uh, a few months later, went into the store, said to the storekeeper, I got, I got all the hogs all pinned up up near the swamp. I need some help to bring them out. The storekeeper couldn't believe it. And others came from miles around to hear the story of how this guy had penned the hogs that everybody just assumed could never be captured. And he said, well, it was really rather simple. At first, I made a clearing at the center of the forest. And then I put, with my axe, and then I put some of the cord at the center of the clearing. And at first, none of the hogs would take any of it. But after a while, the younger ones would scamper out, grab some of the corn, and scamper back into the underbrush. And before long, the older ones were coming, uh, taking the corn, each of them figuring that if they didn't get their fair share, another hog would get into this place. So he said, they all started taking the corn regularly as I put it in the clearing. They stopped grubbing for roots and for acorns on their own. And about that time, he said, I started building a fence around the clearing a little higher each day. And at the right point, he said, I built a trap door. And at the right moment, I sprung it. And his last line was, naturally, they squealed and hollered when they knew I had it. But I can pen any animal on the face of this earth if I can first get him to depend on me for a free handout. That's the process we're describing here that by the time of the Emperor Aurelian became so generous that uh, large portions of the Roman population were now dependent upon uh, the, the, uh, the bread, the pork, the, the salt, the olive oil, and other staples of their diet They're coming from the government, not from their own uh, initiative. And this wasn't true of just, the, just individuals, even cities. Municipalities throughout the, uh, the Roman Empire by that time had become dependent upon the government. That first started under the, the Emperor Hadrian, when cities uh, had spent themselves into financial difficulty, they would come to the central government asking for assistance, and under Hadrian, that assistance began. But in exchange for providing from the central treasury handouts and bailouts to uh, municipalities in, within the uh, Roman Empire, Hadrian appointed imperial curators to basically run the affairs of those local localities. In other words, who, he who pays the piper calls the tune. You can't expect the central government to be sending you checks without them sending you the rules and the mandates uh, to spend it, accord, spend it and perhaps other resources according to the way they see fit. By this time, well advanced beyond the fall of the Republic and the beginning of the empire, Emperors were manipulating public opinion with the public's own money. That's uh, really a part of the essence of any welfare state. You manipulate public opinion by dangling goodies in front of them and reminding them uh, when the time is right of that uh, you are owed their support because of the goodies they are providing. Alexander Hamilton put it well once when he said, control of a man's subsistence is control of his will. Civil wars and conflict and strife increasingly beset uh, the Roman Empire uh, in the second, third, and fourth centuries. And that's the direct result, I firmly <coughs> convinced, of having established this massive state uh, redistributive apparatus that's growing throughout this time and is impinging upon increasingly every aspect of life. Conflict and big government go hand in hand. The bigger it gets, the more people either want to get in charge of it so they can wield the power that it has accumulated, or to keep it at bay so it leaves them relatively alone. Either way, you want to fight to get in charge of it because it's such a massive entity uh, in people's lives. It's just too important to sit back and either allow it to push you around or uh, 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 so, so you've got to get in charge of it or at least uh, have enough influence to try to keep it off your back. Uh, between 180 and 285, that's a 105 year period, of 27 emperors in that period, all but two met violent deaths. Um, and there's some colorful emperors in uh, uh, Rome's first couple hundred years as uh, 
uh, an empire after the uh, after the republic decayed into this dictatorship. Uh, you recall uh, Nero, uh, the famous phrase, uh, Nero fiddled while Rome burnt. I don't know that the that historians have arrived at a firm and definitive conclusion on this. I don't think that we know for certain whether he set fire to part of the city or ordered it to, the fire to be set, but we do know he was delighted that it was burning uh, because he had a vision to uh, replace a portion of the city according to his own grand design. It apparently did little to stop the fire. Uh, he was also the uh, first Roman emperor to resort to the debasement of, it, of the Roman currency. Up until that time, for the previous almost 100 years of this Roman welfare state, whenever the government wanted to spend more money, it would order its legions to go dig a little deeper, and find a little more gold or silver. But it was under Nero that they decided, well, we don't, you know, there's not enough of that to satisfy our demands to spend, so why do we have to have our coins have so much gold and silver in them? Let's reduce the metallic or the precious metal content of the coinage uh, with cheaper junk metals. Uh, so as to have a larger mass of metal to make a lot more uh, cheapen and debased coins from. Uh, a Roman historian by the name of Suetonius uh, wrote a biography of several of the emperors of, the, of that time, and he quotes Nero as saying on one occasion, uh, as rubbing his hands together and saying, let us tax, let us tax again and again. Let us tax until no one owns anything. So this was a this was a nasty guy. He was also known for his uh, for persecuting uh, the Christians and was himself ultimately uh, assassinated. After 100 A.D., lots of evidence of massive corruption in the Roman government, a huge bureaucracy with oppressive taxes and regulations on enterprise. Um, the growing body of of uh, Romans depended upon the government, necessitated spending beyond the capability of the government uh, to raise purely through taxation. There was a financial crisis, incidentally, in the year 33 AD. And uh, Bruce Bartlett, in a paper for the Cato Institute, which you can find online, if you go to cato.org and type Bruce Bartlett uh, Rome, you'll see his paper where he talks about this financial crisis. Guess how the Roman government responded to this crisis in 33 AD? It issued a huge amount of zero interest loans across the economy to various uh, businesses to, to, quote, stimulate an economy. Does that sound familiar? And then you can see pretty directly after that, as so many industries were become so dependent upon government, uh, their continuing uh, economic sickness gives the government further reasons to exercise direct control. The Emperor Domitian in the year 91 AD, in order to raise the price of wine, orders the destruction of half of the vineyards in the provinces. Does that sound like uh, Franklin Roosevelt? For those of you who know the history of the 1930s, it sounds a lot like Franklin Roosevelt's AAA program, destroying uh, produce uh, in order to raise the price and hopefully stimulate the economy. Roosevelt was a sadu. What he was trying was uh, 2,000 years old. Oh, I forgot to mention, too, uh, for, because of that fire, you might even stretch it a bit and say Nero was the father of uh, the first urban renewal program. Uh, maybe you can make that argument. Increasingly, <coughs> the state was becoming the primary source of income for more and more Romans. Uh, all power, as the centuries wear on, uh, is concentrated increasingly in uh, the emperor, his legions, the military, the central government. Businesses that had previously in the centuries past or in the era of the Republic that have been emulated, respected, and subject to low taxation now are heavily taxed, confiscated, and with few exceptions, ultimately nationalized. Uh, you also had, increasingly in Rome, a class of intellectuals, thinkers, priests, scholars, intellectuals, that furthered this awful welfare state process by actually propagating ideas that su support the centralization of power. The emperor is the provider of all things. He deserves respect. He's special. He's different than the rest of us. He doesn't put his pants on one leg at a time or his toga, whatever. He, he's, so we better revere him. 
And in fact, by the time of the Emperor Diocletian, who rules around 300 AD, uh, the order is given that no Roman, no Roman citizen could approach the emperor without first prostrating themselves on the ground in front of him and kissing the hem of his garment. Just a few hundred years before, the, the very thought that Romans would render that kind of servile adoration of their rulers was just incomprehensible. Now it's custom by the time of Diocletian. I hinted at it, but I want to say a bit more about it now, that, that the Roman welfare state as all welfare states do sooner or later, resorted to debasement of its currency to help pay its bills. And it started with Nero, as I mentioned, in the middle of the first century. Uh, the Roman denarius was, at the time of Augustus, which was around the time of the birth of Christ, was 94% silver. By 268 AD, it's 0.02% so almost no, just a speck of it, just enough that they could, uh, the emperors thought that uh, uh, they hadn't committed the ultimate sin, there's a little bit of silver in there, but the rest was junk metal. This was part of the process of paying for these increasing demands, not just of the Roman welfare state at home, but the Roman warfare state abroad, of maintaining itself, uh, uh, its jurisdiction across uh, conquered territories uh, in a way that just was not sustainable, but ultimately uh, would strain the resources of the country or of the uh, empire uh, beyond its ability to meet. It wasn't the first time in history that a regime resorted to the debasement of currency. Uh, the prophet Isaiah in the uh, Old Testament book of Isaiah is quoted as uh, upbraiding the Israelites uh, with these words. He said, thy silver has become dross, thy wine mixed with water. He's describing in the case of both money and wine that they had debased, they had debauched uh, both their currency and wine. They diluted it of its precious value. Uh, so the Romans were doing the same. They didn't have a Fed back then in the sense that we do. They didn't have paper money. They had gold and silver. But they found a way to help pay the bills of the welfare state by debauching the currency with cheap and notes. This had the same effect that it always does anywhere and everywhere. Prices go through the roof as the economy is flooded with this cheapened, debased currency. What do you suppose the reaction of the Roman government ultimately was to a soaring price inflation? Yeah, they continued to debase it. In fact, throughout history, whenever prices go up because of a previous debasement, it's usually used as an excuse to create even more money. Well, now the prices are higher. We've got to print more, or we have to debase more, so as to pay the higher prices. Wage and price controls. Wage and price controls is uh, the main thing I was looking for. Under Emperor Diocletian, who I briefly mentioned earlier, the guy that you had to approach only if you kissed the hem of his garment first, Diocletian was the first Roman emperor to impose comprehensive wage and price controls, which he did in the year 301 <coughs> AD. If you ever have a chance, and some of you perhaps have seen it already, uh, to go to the Smithsonian in Washington, they have a significant exhibit on the edict of 301, with parts of it reproduced. You can actually see uh, the schedule of many of the prices that he fixed. Much of it was a wage and price freeze. Other prices were manipulated a bit and frozen. In any event, it was comprehensive, centralized, top-down uh, wage and price controls to be enforced by the penalty of death. And I have a quote for you from the Roman historian Lactantius, who wrote this in the year 314, looking back on the previous uh, 13 years of uh, wage and price controls. He says, after the many oppressions which he, Diocletian, put in practice had brought a general shortage upon the empire, he then set himself to regulate the prices of all vendable things. There was much bloodshed upon very slight and trifling accounts, and the people brought provisions no more to markets since they could not get a reasonable price for them. And this increased the shortage so much that at last, after many had died by it, the law itself was laid aside. But the harm done to the Roman economy was massive and lasting. Rome never recovered from this, uh, this period. 
uh, Diocletian, uh, it was under his reign that fully 50% of the men of the empire were on the central government's payroll. Emperor worship had reached its zenith uh, under at this period. And this is in some ways is kind of the ultimate totalitarian imposition. Diocletian froze everyone into their occupations. In other words, uh, you know, it's very hard to plan an economy, isn't it? It's kind of confusing, it's difficult because people are, uh, they, they go in all kinds of directions. They don't always do what the central planner wants them to do. So Diocletian ordered it, that we end this chaos of individual choice by freezing people into their occupations. If you were a shoemaker, you now had to be a shoemaker for the rest of your working life. So this becomes, this totalitarian welfare state now becomes a, 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 incredibly rigid society where people couldn't even change occupations without special permission from the central authority. All of this robbery by the state, and that's what it amounts to, is a sign of the breakdown of, of any sense of moral law, this idea that, uh, you know, that, that property is something that is earned and accumulated by people because of their efforts and therefore should be respected. This is gone. Uh, by the fourth century in ancient Rome. Property now is something to be plundered, and if not by the state, well then by you. And so you see the rise of, uh, of violent crime all across the Roman Empire. If, if, if you've come to believe, because you've been taught, and public policy has promoted it for generations, that you're entitled to live at somebody else's expense, that the state serves a useful and proper function by taking from some and giving to others, it's only a hop, skip, and a jump from there to where you might decide, why, why should I wait until the state gets it for me? Why can't I just eliminate the middleman and go get it myself? So the very notion of the welfare state breeds a disrespect for uh, private property. It leads itself to uh, uh, crime uh, beyond that which the state itself is committing. Anybody just know? Occupy, right? What's that? Just occupy it. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody know who was the last, if you could say it was an organized resistance, who was the last group within Rome itself uh, who, as a group, as an identified group, resisted the tyranny of the Roman welfare state? Who am I thinking of? Christians? Yeah, the, the, the Christians, because for sp spiritual reasons. They didn't worship the emperor because they worshiped someone else. They didn't partake in the Roman welfare state because they were essentially, until Constantine, they were outlawed driven underground, living in the catacombs of Rome. And this is significant because you might say that as long as there was somebody who hadn't yet climbed on the bandwagon, on the gravy train, maybe there was hope for the rest of Rome. As long as somebody held fast to some other old virtues like self-reliance and worship of something higher than, than, than uh, uh, an emperor, maybe there was hope that ideas like that could be rekindled once again. But even the Christians <coughs> threw in the towel. When Constantine, in the early 300s, declares himself to be Rome's first Christian emperor and grants toleration to Christianity, he also puts, brings the church out of hiding and puts it on the dole, too. And uh, uh, as a result of, uh, of its dependence dependency, the organized church anyway, becomes corrupted over time and part of the problem, not part of the solution. Uh, in 410 AD, as a significant event happens, you, by this time you've got a full-blown totalitarian dictatorship. People frozen in their occupations, wages and prices uh, periodically fixed and in, uh, in, uh, currency uh, essentially worthless police everywhere in the form of uh, uh, the Roman army. In 410 AD, uh, a significant event happens when Alaric the Goth invades uh, Rome itself and for three days occupies the city. And you might say, well, okay, that should have awakened them. Rome, which had proudly uh, repelled foreign invasions uh, for several hundred years, now the city itself, the capital itself, is occupied for three days <coughs> by Germanic invaders. They're unable to hold the city after three days of sacking it, killing a lot of people. They leave the city. Did Romans come to the census and realize that by centralizing power and destroying their economy through the welfare state, they have become uh, so weak as to be vulnerable to this kind of thing? And did they turn it around? No. 
And so Rome actually, the city itself, and the Western Roman Empire comes to an end in 476 AD in a rather anticlimactic fashion when Odoacher, another of these primitive uh, Germanic chieftains, enters the city uh, and declares himself the new authority. He's welcomed by many Romans who no doubt felt that the, anything was better than the tyranny of their own tax collectors and their own, uh, and their own rulers. The last of the Roman emperors is pushed aside, and that marks the end of the Western Roman Empire. The eastern half, centered in Constantinople, will last another thousand years. Uh, but liberty and independence, civilization, screeches to a halt uh, in 476. Now, he who can look at this record and say, well, it was foreign invaders that did them in, I think are missing what Romans did to themselves. They transformed themselves from a society where there was significant respect for the individual and the freedom into a society of sheep dependent upon a central government who was happy to accumulate power at the biggest expense. By the time many of them perhaps came to their senses, it was too late. You see the lessons, I think, don't you? This is how most freedoms in world history are lost through salami tactics, one slice at a time. Not, you know, some people have been free and lost their freedoms in one fell swoop through foreign invasion, but lots of times, like in ancient Rome, it's a gradual affair. And it happens because people with, at all are doing it to themselves. They change their ideas, it leads to changes in policy, destructive changes that they embrace because they think that at least in the short run, they'll get something that will make them more secure but it comes at the expense of their long-run security, their independence, and their liberty. With that, I'm sorry, I've actually gone longer than I intended to, but if we have a little time, I'll be happy to take some questions. Yes, sir. Sir, I'd like to I'd like to be optimistic that we can roll things back, but are you aware of any society in history that has been able to roll back yeah. the decline? Is there any society that has rolled it back? Uh, the closest, and I realize this is not a very good example, but it, it's at least an example of a society that, that undertook substantial changes for the better in a short period of time. It's not an example of one that went as far as Rome did down with tubes and then turned it around. But uh, I'm thinking of Britain. In, uh, by the, after the war with, the, uh, with America, and for the next 20 or 30 years, Britain was this, uh, increasingly debauched and dispirited and demoralized society, uh, uh, and a protectionist society. And, uh, and, and yet, by the 1830s and 40s, there's a transformation that begins to happen. It's very apparent by, the, by 1900. Britain went from, you know, in the late 1700s, uh, uh, corruption, the uh, debauchery in the streets, the drunkenness, the, uh, you know, in Britain was epidemic. What do we talk about when we speak of Britain 100 years later? We call it what? We, we speak of Victorian Britain. Victorian values, something many people say they went over, head over heels in the other direction. But in a relatively short period of time, that's a society that picked itself up, cleaned up its act, and became the capital of capital. The freest country, the most, uh, 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 the richest country in the world until the United States passed it in 1914. So it hasn't even been 100 years that per capita income in America surpassed Britain's. Uh, so they underwent a substantial change for the better. Yeah, and you'll see in the movie Amazing Grace some elements of that. Because William Wilberforce, who led the effort in Parliament against slavery, happens to be one of the key figures in this moral renaissance as well in the 19th century. Yes? How about when this in teams as an alternative uh, group that managed to slow down the decline uh, for another thousand years, yeah. they, they hang in there. Well, uh, I'll offer a couple of reasons. So first of all, Byzant uh, the Byzantines never achieved the, the degree of freedom that Rome had in its, early, in its Republican days. But they still held it together uh, in, a, in uh, a freer society than was the case in barbarian-dominated Rome of the Dark Ages. Uh, but a bit, one big reason is, you know, that uh, they did not debase their currency until the 15th century. 
And there's a direct correlation, I think, between the soundness of a nation's currency and the soundness of its people and its economy, and its strength as a nation, able to be independent and hold its own against uh, a hostile world. The Byzant was a gold coin that persisted for a thousand years. So, you, you know, when Rome went hell-bent for a welfare state, spent itself into bankruptcy, corrupted its coinage for a thousand years, the Eastern uh, Empire did not do that. So, as, uh, as much as they were a, a society of truly big government, they still were freer than much of the rest of the world, and I think that's in part reflected, at least, in the fact that they kept their, their currency sound. Once you debase your currency, not only is that act itself a sign of weakness and corruption, it also has, uh, it further weakens and corrupts a society. Is it vulnerable to, uh, to foreign attack? It undermines uh, uh, the economy and the ability to produce and sustain yourself. So I give them credit for that anyway. I think that's part of the reason. Maybe they learned something from the Roman experience, and uh, that's why they kept their currency sound for a thousand years. Uh, I would point to one other factor which also ties into the uh, Renaissance in England is trade. Uh, yeah. Byzantium, Constantinople became the the center of the world of trade. Yeah. Uh, the river roads that came down from Russia that brought the Vikings uh, when it was impossible to travel in the Mediterranean. Yeah. Uh, they were able to travel uh, through uh, through those ways to Constantinople and also tie into the Eastern Silk Roads to bring, yeah. bring trade. And that's what made them great and made the sure. England great. I'm sure you're right. Okay.